Hey everybody, welcome to the Mandalik. I'm John, as always, and it's time for the Black Shadows Over Innistrad set review. We're going to go through every single card in Black in Shadows Over Innistrad and discuss how they would do in Limited. There, of course, are three disclaimers to my set reviews. If you haven't heard them yet, you should probably go check out the White and Blue set reviews. They're nothing major, they just kind of give a, a frame of reference for my set reviews. But without further ado, we are going to jump right on into the first card. Up first, we have a Cursed Witch. A Cursed Witch is three and a black for a creature human shaman at Uncommon. It's a 4-2, and it says spells your opponent's cast that target a Cursed Witch cost one generic less to cast. When a Cursed Witch dies, return it to the battlefield transformed under your control attached to target opponent. So, of course, there's a transform side, and it is Infectious Curse. It is an enchantment or a curse at Uncommon. This is a, a mechanic... Uh, it's not really a mechanic. It's something from the original Innistrad block, uh, Curses. Uh, it says Enchant Player. So, of course, when it comes back, you choose a player to enchant. It's going to be in a 1v1 draft for your opponent, the only opponent you have. It says spells that you cast that target enchanted player cost one less to cast. So every single spell that you cast targeting your opponent costs one less. At the beginning of enchanted player's upkeep, that player loses one life and you gain one life. So you drain them every single turn. Very important to note, it is spells that target the player, not things the player controls. So target player sacrifices a creature. That costs one less to cast. Deal three damage to target creature. That does not cost one less to cast. So be aware of that. And that's going to be a, a fairly big reason uh, for the ultimate grade that I'm going to give this card. Um, yeah, so... Let's go back to the creature side for a second. It seems okay. You know, it's a 4-2 four, for 4, which are not the best stats. We've seen that time and time and time again. 4-2s just die way too much to be throwing 4 mana into them. Now, you want this one to die, kind of. So you can attack with this very liberally. You can attack in, and if you kill something, cool. The downside is that they're probably going to block with a 2-drop. So you're wasting your 4-drop on their 2-drop, which is some fairly serious loss of equity there. They're definitely coming out of a head there. Um, the fact that they can hit the Accursed Witch with spells for one less mana is not really that big of a deal, because if they kill it, that's kind of what you're sort of hoping for, I think. But I'm not even really hoping for the other side, because the other side is just not impactful enough at all. There are so few spells that target my opponent, the odds of me having one is really low. So it's not really going to be that big of a deal that I can play them for one generic mana less. That's not really going to come up all that often. And the one uh, life drain every single turn is fine, but it's not going to win games unless I've managed to successfully stall out the game. Um, there was a card called Curse of the Pierced Heart, I believe, in Innistrad, and that was uh, curse the player, and then they get uh, a life loss each turn, or they take a damage each turn. Now, that was, was a one-point swing. A, a life drain is technically a two-point swing in that they're losing one and you're gaining one. But it's still a really slow clock. Really slow clock. If you're not already dominating the game, or at least totally locking up the game, then that's not going to be that big of a deal. You know, if, if, they're doing, if you're doing one and gaining one and they're doing more than two damage or really more than one damage a turn, uh, they're still going to win. They're, they're still going to outrace you. So this just does not feel impactful enough to me. It's cool. I like it. I, I love all the double face cards that aren't always a creature on both sides. I think the design is amazing, and I love this card for that reason. But I just don't think it's impactful enough to be that great of a card, and I'm not going to take it too highly. I think it's fine. And if I had one, if it was kind of the only playable black card in the pack, I would take it. And I would probably give it a try, at least the first copy. So I am going to start on a C+, but I expect to see this to go down even more, I think. So C+. Up next, we have Alms of the Vein. Alms of the Vein is a two and a black sorcery at common, and it says target opponent loses three life and you gain three life. Madness, single black. Uh, no, no thanks. Uh, sorcery speed, lightning bolt that only hits one, that only hits players and gains you some life. Not really what I'm looking for. Lightning bolt is so good because it's 
instant speed and it hits creatures more so than players. Yeah, it's fantastic that it hits players. It, it makes it so much better. But if it only hit players, it would have been much worse, even if you gained some life off of it. Now, making it cost three mana a lot of the time, making it not even lightning bolt, that's really not what I'm looking for. Uh, this just does not seem impactful. I mean, maybe if you can get like 10 of these, I guess, but no. No, 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 no. This is so low impact, just hitting an opponent. Not what I want to be doing. Even if I can madness this, I don't want to be doing it. And I certainly don't want to be doing it uh, at sorcery speed for three mana. So totally out on it. Solid F. Up next, we have Asylum Visitor. Asylum Visitor is one in a black for a creature, vampire, wizard at rare. It's a 3-1. And she says, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, if that player has no cards in hand, you draw a card and you lose a life. Madness, one and a black. So the madness cost is the same as the regular cost, so all the real the, the only real bonus here is that you can flash this in on your opponent's turn if you can somehow discard it. I do like three ones for two. We've talked about that to great length, and the fact that this one helps you fill your hand later in the game is quite nice. Um, the madness cost being the same as the regular cost it is, as I said, just so that you can give this thing flash, sort of, if you can discard it. Um, but really, I'm just looking to play this as an aggressive 3-1 that will get me some, uh, you know, bonus value later on in the game. I do really like that it's at the beginning of each player's upkeep. If that player has no cards, you draw a card. So if your opponent's top decking, you get to draw a card. You are fueling yourself when your opponent is already in trouble, and that's awesome. And then, of course, you're fueling yourself if you're out of cards, too. Uh, now, note that this is not a May ability, so you will be taking this damage, this one this one less loss of life regardless, so you may just die from this thing. And that that has happened. I recall Kothaped killing a number of uh, people who were playing it. Uh, so you definitely want to be careful there, but I'm pretty happy with this thing just because it does fill kind of multiple roles. It's just an awesome 3-1 aggressive creature on turn two, and it's uh, some value later on in the game. So I'm pretty happy with Asylum Visitor. Uh, I'm, I'm happy enough to give it a B-. I, I don't think it's a bomb. I don't think it's amazing, but I think it is uh, a pretty solid card. So B-. Up next, we have Behind the Scenes. Behind the Scenes is two and a black for an enchantment at Uncommon. Creatures you control have Skulk. And then for four and a white, creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. Three mana to give my entire team Skulk is not terrible. It's not great, but it's not terrible. Uh, this must go in an aggressive deck, though, I think. You, you don't really want this in your control deck. You know, giving your nothing or your walls or your one fives for most of the game Skulk and then giving your five, five flyer finisher Skulk doesn't really do anything for you. Um, so yeah, I think it really wants to be in an aggressive deck. Now the problem there, of course, is that an aggressive deck is not going to want to waste a turn casting an enchantment. They're just not going to want to do that. And Skulk, while I think it's going to be decent, I don't think it's going to be game-breaking. I think you're still going to be blocked by a lot of things with Skulk. Um, so I'm just not huge onto it. Uh, this is... Also, just not that good outside of black-white, I don't think. I don't think just giving your team Skulk is all that good. I think you do want to have the plus one, plus one ability. But the plus one, plus one ability is expensive. Five mana just to turn this on. This is uh, Cliffside Lookout's ability. And Cliffside Lookout's ability sometimes came into effect, but it wasn't terribly common for it to come into, you know, kind of game-breaking effect. I would say every one out of maybe 10 games it came into play. Um, so I'm just not super sold on behind the scenes. Um, I think it might be an okay 23rd card if you're in black-white, um, but I'm not going to go out of my way. Uh, I'm just giving this kind of a middle-of-the-road C. Next up, we have Behold the Beyond. Behold the Beyond is five black-black for a sorcery at Mythic, and it says discard your hand, Search your library for three cards and put those cards into your hand, then shuffle your library. Wow, absolutely not. So tutors aren't that good in limited. They need to be really cheap. I'm talking one mana cheap. Seven mana is unplayable. You are not ever going to waste seven mana on a tutor. But you get to discard your hand that enables madness. You are not going to have mana left over after casting a 7 drop to cast anything off your madness. And if you're looking to enable delirium this late in the game, then you're just playing delirium wrong. Uh, yeah, this 
card is just stone unplayable. This is the card that I'm going to open, and I'm going to go, wow, a mythic. Oh, man. Oh, and then I'm going to pass it around the table until somebody snaps it up because, oh, my God, it's a mythic, and they really shouldn't have snapped it up. Uh, yeah, this is just garbage, I think. It's, it's an absolute F-. minus. Uh, I'm never, ever, ever going to play this card or touch this card unless I'm doing a Wacky Wednesday rare draft and I have no choice. Uh, yeah, F-. minus. Next up, we have Biting Rain. Biting Rain is two black black for a sorcery at Uncommon, and it says all creatures get minus two, minus two until end of turn. Madness for two and a black. Uh, yeah, this is the effect that we've had in basically every single set in the past couple of years. I'm pretty sure every set has had minus two, minus two to all creatures. Now, usually, it costs three mana. This one costs four mana because sometimes it costs three mana. I don't really like that this costs four mana just because sometimes it costs what we've normally been casting. Um, this effect has really kind of bounced around. I think it was a lot better in cons block where we had a lot of morphs running around and a lot of manifests and we had a lot of tutus running around. This really comes down to how many X2s are being played. And how well can you craft a deck that doesn't play X2 so that this doesn't have too much of a symmetrical effect? And I just don't think it's all that great in most decks. I, th I think it's fairly sideboard range these days. Um, only main deckable if you're really desperate. And if you are main decking it, make sure that you are playing properly with it. If it's in your hand, hold back those X2s as long as you can. Make your opponent overcommit and then blow them up and hope that they aren't overcommitting with a whole bunch of X3s and your spell does nothing. Um, yeah, D+, plus. I, th I think this generally should stay on the sideboard. Next up, we have Call the Bloodline. Call the Bloodline is one and a black for an enchantment at Uncommon. For a single generic mana and discarding a card, you can put a 1-1 black vampire knight creature token with lifelink onto the battlefield. Activate this ability only once each turn. Uh, the 1-1 one -one here is fine big whoop though i think this arguably is slightly more for madness uh it, it's not a free madness enabler but it does cost just a single mana which is nice and cheap and i think it's fairly solid for madness um as you've heard me mention you know i, I worry about how costly some madness enablers are and i think this one is uh uh, nice and cheap, but there are a lot cheaper ones out there. Uh, the downsides, of course, are this is uncommon, so you may just never see it in a draft to enable your madness. Um, secondly, the effect does so little that you're spending a card that's not necessarily good enough to be in your deck otherwise. Uh, ultimately, this really relies on how good Black Red Madness is and how much you need tokens for it how much you need those token vampires to be pumped up or, or in some way affected by the other vampires, or if you need them as sack outlets. But I don't know. I, I think the spread on this card is pretty large. I, I think it could be terrible all the way up to pretty decent. My instinct is to give this a C minus. I just don't think it's impactful enough to actually see play or, or actually appropriately see play. But if there's a place for it to slot in, I could definitely see this jumping out. But I'm going to go with C minus. I'm, I'm going to go with my gut to start uh, and, and probably not play this too often. Next up, we have Creeping Dread. Creeping Dread is three and a black for an enchantment at Uncommon. At the beginning of your upkeep, each player discards a card. Each opponent who discarded a card that shares a card type with the card you discarded loses three life. Uh, players reveal the discarded cards simultaneously. So at the beginning of your upkeep, what happens is you, as the active player, sets aside a card and says, this is the card I'm going to discard, but you don't show it. And then your opponent does it, and then you flip them up and you see if they match. And if they do, then uh, your opponent loses three life. This is bad. This is just stone on... Totally unplayable. Um, yeah, so it's a four mana enchantment. So you're taking off turn four, or you're spending probably most of your mana you're probably taking a turn to cast this regardless of whenever you cast it and then you're enabling your opponent's madness and delirium you are actively helping them do what they want to be doing actively helping them all for the potential that you're gonna guess what they discard and discard the same thing and say haha take three life to which they say haha play my madness card or haha i have delirium this is just bad like flat out bad this is an f this this should never be in your deck ever and i'm going to be so happy when i see it on the other side of the board 
All right, that was a lot of bad slash not good cards in a row. Let's see if we can get a better one here. Crow of Dark Tidings. Crow of Dark Tidings is two and a black for a creature zombie bird at common. It's a 2-1 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield or dies, put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Uh, seems fine. You know, it's a 2-2 flyer for three, which is totally fine, even decently pickable. You know, not first pick and not high pick, but mid-pack kind of, oh, here's a black card, and it'll go in my deck most of the time, or at least some of the times. Uh, milling at least two cards is fine. Helpful if you have Delirium or any other reason that you would want cards to go from the your uh, uh, library to graveyard. I think it's fine enough to be kind of filler level, slightly above if you really want to mess around with the graveyard, so I'm totally fine giving this a C. Uh, not too much more, not too much less. Next up, we have Deadweight. Deadweight is a single black mana for an enchantment aura at common enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets minus two, minus two. It's the Black Shock, although it's not instant speed. It's sorcery speed since it's an enchantment. Uh, but yeah, Deadweight was totally fine the first time around. It was back in Innistrad. Uh, minus two, minus two should hit a decent enough number of things, especially for a single black mana that you do want to take this relatively highly. Uh, in addition, since it's an aura, you can still hit something bigger than an X2 and make it something more manageable. As well, it's an enchantment in your graveyard for Delirium. Uh, yeah, Deadweight just seems super solid. Uh, I've always loved Deadweight, and uh, I will continue to uh, give this a B-. It's not premium removal, of course, but it's just super-duper solid. So, B-. Next up, we have Diagraph Colossus. Diagraph Colossus is two and a black for a creature zombie giant at rare. It's a 2-2. Uh, Diagraph Colossus enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it for each zombie card in your graveyard. Whenever you cast a zombie spell, put a 2-2 two -two black zombie creature token onto the battlefield tapped. Um, this depends entirely on how good the other zombies are and how good the zombie deck is. If there's enough, if the zombie deck is viable enough that you can build around it hard, then you should probably first pick this and build around it hard. Uh, if there's not, then you probably want to leave this in the pack for somebody else to try their luck or, or take it as kind of a, a three mana two two that might sometimes get bigger and maybe makes you some extra zombies. Um, this card's so reliant on so many other cards that I think it has a really high ceiling and a really low floor. At worst, I feel like this is like a C minus, and that's if you're taking this and you're playing black red vampires, or, or you're just not playing that many zombies. And on the other hand, I could see this being up to an A minus if you are in fact in solid blue black zombies. I think this card is just super dependent on what deck you're in. So you know, would I first pick it and go into zombies? I think so. I think I would. I, I think I would consider going into zombies and taking this first pick, pack one, pick one. I think that is an option. And uh, I, I definitely would be happy to see it in pack two, pack three if I was already down that route. But at that point, I don't know if it would make enough sense for me to switch into that deck if I got this pack two or pack three. So huge, huge spread on this. I'm going to go C minus slash A minus, depending on where uh, or what your deck is and how your draft is going. Next up, we have Elusive Tormentor. Elusive Tormentor is two black black for a creature vampire wizard at rare. It's a 4-4, and for a single generic mana and discarding a card, you can transform Elusive at Tormentor. Elusive Tormentor then flips over and becomes Insidious Mist. Insidious Mist is a creature elemental. It's an 0-1. It has hexproof. It's indestructible. And Insidious Mist can't block and can't be blocked. Whenever Insidious Mist attacks and isn't blocked, you may pay two black. If you do, transform it. Uh, yeah, this card seems insane. This card is just not going to die. It's a 4-4 for four, 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 which is totally fine right then and there. It basically cannot be removed. As long as you have a card in your hand and a mana up, you cannot kill this thing. Because if they hit it with a removal spell and you have a mana and a card in hand, you discard it and then flip it on over. And A, it's indestructible, so it can't be killed. It can't be destroyed. It could be minus exit, minus, minus exit, though. Uh, you know, minus two, minus two, dead weight or something like that. But surprise, it's got hexproof too, so the spell just gets countered anyways. Uh, if you are in combat and your opponent plays a combat trick that might end up killing this, you flip it over. It's not going to kill the creature that got uh, the combat trick put on it, but it's indestructible. So it just bounces off of it. Uh, and then, of course, when you have time, when you have mana, you can swing on in with this, pay two and a black, flip it on over, because uh, it can't have been blocked, and so its final ability is live, and then you've got a 4-4 that got through basically unblocked. And then, hey, if they try to hit it with a counter spell, you pay a mana and discard a card and flip it on back over. Uh, yeah, this is... Uh, <laughs> this card's going to be annoying. 
I'm not going to be happy when I see this card on the other side of the battlefield. Uh, I'm going to be basically throwing my hands up and saying, oh, well, you have a basically invincible 4-4. Uh, it does take some work to get a whole lot of value out of it. You know, to get the most value out of it, you're going to need to be paying... Uh, mana and discarding cards and paying three mana and flipping it over and over and over and uh, trying to get through but I don't think it's I don't think it's a, a Herculean task at all I think it's I think it's totally manageable I'm, I'm very happy with this card I would first pick it every time I want to play with it really bad I don't want to play against it uh, I'm gonna go with a, a solid A on this I, I really like Elusive Tormentor Next up, we have Ever After. Ever After is four black black for a sorcery at rare. It says return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Each of those creatures is a black zombie in addition to its other colors and types. Put Ever After on the bottom of its owner's library. Um, graveyard to battlefield should be powerful, but it never really gets there in recent draft sets. In cube, yeah, you know, you think have things like Animate Dead. You have things that cost a mana to go from graveyard to battlefield, or, or one and a black to go from graveyard to battlefield. Four black black is a little bit much, but you are getting two creatures out of it, so that's not too bad. Um, but you have to have two creatures in the graveyard. You know, you have to have your bomb already dead in order for this to have the biggest impact. Otherwise, you're doing something like bringing back a couple of tutus. And that's just not impactful enough for six mana. I think too much has to go right for this to be worth the six mana cost that you have to pay for it. Um, and I just don't see that happening enough. I'm never going to be happy casting this spell for six mana if I'm not bringing back at least something that's going to end the game, if not a pair of somethings that are going to end the game. If I'm just bringing back early game creatures, this just isn't worth it to me. Uh, I'm going to pass this pretty regularly, and I'm not going to really look to play it too, too much, so I, I've got to go with a C- on it. Uh, I, I, I've always wanted Graveyard to Battlefield to be good, but it's just always been too expensive in recent sets, and I think this is uh, just more of the same, so C- for me. Next up, we have Farbog Revenant. Farbog Revenant is two and a black for a creature spirit. It's a 1-3. It's got Skulk, and it's got Lifelink. Uh, and it's a common, I think I said that. Um, yeah, this is fine. It could be worse, but it could absolutely be better. It's basically a guaranteed one life each turn, uh, but that's not really a reason to care or, or consider putting this into your deck. Could be okay as a sideboard card if you want to stop a bunch of two X's from coming at you and gain some life off of it as well. Um, but I think you generally can do better than this. I, th I think you should cut it pretty darn liberally. Uh, I've got to go with a C- minus on it. It's just not impactful enough to really be in most decks, I think. Next up, we have From Under the Floorboards. From Under the Floorboards is three black black for a sorcery at rare. It has Madness X black black. And it says, put three 2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens onto the battlefield tapped and you gain three life. If From Under the Floorboards Madness cost was paid instead, put X of those tokens onto the battlefield tapped and you gain X life. So you get a bunch of zombies. Five mana for three 2-2s two, and three life is fine. It's not the worst. It's even under-costed on the vanilla test. You're getting 6-6 six, six for 5, as opposed to 6-6 six, six for 6, and you're getting 3 life off of it as well. It's not the worst. It's not amazing, but it would definitely be decent in a zombies deck where you're pumping up those zombies or giving those zombies death touch or in some way having zombie synergy going on. Um, is it first pickable? I don't think so. I don't think you take this and go into the zombie deck. I think you have to have a reason to go into the zombie deck first, and I don't think this is one. Uh, if you can madness this, it gets a little bit better, but the issue here is the mana cost of madness enablers, of course, as I've been saying. If you're paying two, three mana to discard this card, that's two, three mana that you're going to be paying less. And if you pay three into the X cost, you're just casting the spell for normal, but at instant speed rather than sorcery speed. So you really probably want to be doing four as your X, maybe five. And that, of course, is getting to the maximum that you're ever going to do in limited uh, on average in the most games. So I don't know. I, I think this is basically unplayable for two black black or one black black. I don't think it's remotely good enough if you're going less than the, uh, the normal cost. So I think this ultimately is kind of mid-pack pickup. Maybe even a little bit late pickup if nobody else happens to be in zombies and it comes back around. But I, as I said, I don't think this is a reason to go into zombies. I think it's a great pickup once you're in zombies. So 
I'll go with a C plus on it, not too much higher. Up next, we have Ghoul Colors Accomplice. Ghoul Colors Accomplice is one and a black for a creature human rogue at common. It's a 2-2, two -two, and for three and a black and exile Ghoul Colors Accomplice from your graveyard, you can put a 2-2 two -two black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. So it's just like those white uh, uh, humans that have had this sort of ability. I really kind of wish this mechanic had a name, really. Maybe it's just too disparate of effects of what the tokens are that it produces to really get a name, but I feel like they could have put a, uh, uh, not a keyworded mechanic, but rather a, a, reminder, a reminder word like delirium or like uh, heroic or things like that. But anyways, um, this is just a pure upside bear, right? It's a 2-2 two, two for 2, which is 100% playable. That's the definition of a C. And then later in the game, after it's died off, you can get another 2-2 two, two with a relevant creature type at that. It's a zombie. Uh, sign me up. You know, I'll, I'll play the first two of these at least, I think. They're not amazing. They're not going to win you games, but they are exactly what your average draft deck needs to have. So uh, I'm going to go C plus on this, maybe even B minus. You know what? I've talked myself up to a B minus on this. Uh, yeah, I, I just really, really, really like this card. It's just super duper solid. Up next, we have Ghoul Steed. Ghoul Steed is four and a black for a creature zombie horse. At Uncommon, it's a 4-4. For two and a black and to discard two cards, you can return Ghoul Steed from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Meh, it's a 4-4 for five, and a vanilla 4-4 for five at that, uh, which is not really my cup of tea. That's not where I want to be in a, uh, a game of limited magic, uh, as unless it's, you know, 8th edition draft or something like that. Uh, that's getting to be in sort of the big, dumb, not good without abilities area that usually we see in green, not so much in black. Uh, being able to bring it back for two cards and some mana doesn't seem to make it all that much better. Uh, I wouldn't justify this as a madness enabler. It's three mana to cost or th to discard those cards, so you best have a lot of mana left over. So I don't really consider it to be that great of a madness enabler. Uh, maybe it's a slightly okay delirium enabler, but I don't think you want to be discarding your cards to enable delirium too much because you should be playing those cards. Unless your delirium effect is literally saying win the game, you should be playing those cards instead of just throwing them away. Um, yeah, this just doesn't seem good to me. It doesn't seem good to me at all. It's overcosted for what it is. Um, its ability is not that amazing. C minus. I'm just out on Ghoul Steed. I don't see it being that good at all. Up next, we have Gissa's bidding. Gissa's bidding. I've never actually said her name out loud. I don't know if it's Gissa or Gissa. Anyways, let me know in the comments. Uh, Gissa's bidding. Gissa. Let's go with Gissa. It says, put two, two, two black zombie creature tokens onto the battlefield. Madness, two and a black, as opposed to two black, black. Um, totally fine. You know, it's fine enough without madness. Two black, black for two, two, twos is pretty similar to allied reinforcements from Oath of the Gatewatch, which was three and a white for two, two, two uh, white knight ally tokens. Um, it's not amazing, but it's fine. It's going to get you two, two, twos for four. It totally passes the vanilla test. It gives you two relevant creature types. Um, with Madness, you can get yourself a one mana discount, which doesn't change it too much, but makes it all that slightly more playable. Um, I don't super care about that one mana discount, but it doesn't really change my rating of this card. I think it's just totally fine. I, I, don't, I don't think it's a super high pick. Um, I think it's a pick when you're in black for sure, and you're uh, even more likely in the zombies deck, I think you say, hey, cool, I got one of these. I'm going to take it, and it's going in my deck. Uh, total C plus for me. Not much higher than that. It is just two two twos, but not lower than that either. Just solid C plus. Next up is Grotesque Mutation, probably the grossest art in this set. One and a block for an instant at common target creature gets plus three, plus one, and gains lifelink until end of turn. Uh, sure Strike begat brute strength who begat grotesque mutation this is the latest version of this uh, sort of combat trick that we've seen uh, different variations on mostly in red this is black's first crack at it uh, but it's the latest one black one red one whatever uh, get plus three plus one and a keyworded ability trick uh, this is totally fine it often will work as removal while sometimes ending games the lifelinks a really nice touch um, but that's a little bit more defensive than getting first strike or trample would have been like sure strike or brute strength um, seems totally playable though as the first copy uh, in your deck Maybe I would even play a second copy. Um, yeah, this just seems fine. It seems like a pretty solid card for 
most decks. It's going to have some versatility there. It's going to work on defense. It's going to work on offense. It's going to work to end the game if you're uh, getting through with something and you need those extra three points of damage. It's going to get you back into the game with a whole bunch of life gain. Just totally a solid combat trick. So total C plus for me. Not any higher because it is just a combat trick, but total C plus. Coming up next is Heir of Falconrath. Heir of Falconrath is one and a black for a creature vampire at uncommon. It's a 2 1. Discard a card, transform Heir of Falconrath, activate this ability only once each turn. On the flip side, it transforms into Heir to the Night. Uh, Heir to the Night is a creature vampire berserker. It's a 3 2, and it's a flyer. Uh, I like this. I like this card a lot. It is aggressive. It's basically a 3 2 flyer for 2. So you cast this on turn 2. And it's 2-1, and you can immediately, although you may not want to do this until uh, the end of your opponent's turn because there's no real point because it doesn't have haste, but you discard a card, and you've got a 3-2 flyer ready to attack on turn 3. That's aggressive. That is super aggressive. That's going to put so many games away so early. Um, being able to help out Delirium is nice, or maybe even Madness. Um, obviously, that's not going to help you on turn 2. There's very few cards that you're going to be able to discard on turn two and be able to play for the Madness cost. That's uh, more of a, a late game thing if this does come down later in the game. Um, but if this comes down early, you should be flipping it ASAP. Do not wait around and try to be cute. Do not wait around to discard a card until you have a Madness card in your hand. Flip this thing and start hitting them in the air for three immediately. I like this a lot. Uh, I don't think it's first pickable, but I think it's like third pickable or fourth pickable. It's it, it's up there. I've got to go with a solid B on it. I really, really, really like Heir of, Heir of Falconrath and Heir to the Night. Up next, we have Hound of the Farbogs. Hound of the Farbogs is four black for a creature zombie hound. It's a common, it's a 5-3, and it's got Delirium. Hound of the Farbogs has Menace as long as you have Delirium. So it's a 5-3 for five. And if you have Delirium, it's a 5-3 Menace for five. Uh, meh. 5 3 for 5 just isn't all that good. You know, we get 5 2s for 4 here and there, and they are basically unplayable. They're just super bad cards. Uh, 5 3 for 5, getting an extra point of toughness, not that great. Having Menace, maybe, isn't really that great either. This just dies to so many things, and with my hesitancy on Delirium already, I'm out on this. A very late pick, and you should cut this almost every single time that you can. Um, C minus at best. C minus. Up next, we have Indulgent Aristocrat. Indulgent Aristocrat is a single black mana for a 1 1 lifelink creature vampire on common. Uh, pay two and sack a creature. Put a plus one plus one counter on each vampire you control. Uh, I, I like this. I, I like this a fair bit. Uh, it's, it's definitely interesting, and I definitely feel like it's also sort of a build-around almost, or, or part of a, a greater deck. It's a 1-1 one, one for 1 with lifelink, which generally isn't playable. You know, we had Hopeful Eidolon, and, but it was playable because it had Bestow, because it uh, went on a creature, and then later in the game when that creature died, you still had a 1-1 one, one lifelink. It, it was kind of bonus value. This doesn't have the bonus value of that, but... It's got a really cool and potentially high-powered mechanic to it. If you're able to pump out vampire tokens, so I, actually this could play well with uh, Call the Bloodlines. If you could pump out vampire tokens and sack one of those tokens to give counters to all your other vampire tokens as well as your other natural vampires, and then just continue doing that, um, this could get out of this could get out of hand really, really fast. It is a one-one. So it's going to die really readily. So you're not going to want to be attacking with this thing. You're, wanna, you're going to want to hold this back. Um, the one mana really helps you power this out. It, it takes nothing to cast this on turn one. I definitely want to see a deck come out built around this. And it, it's certainly going to be Black Red Vampires. Whether or not that's Black Red Madness Vampires or Black Red Vampires Tokens, that's going to be the deck where this is going to uh, uh, shine. Now, it does put tokens on itself as well, so it will pretty quickly stop being a 1-1 and become a 2-2, a 3-3, a 4-4, etc. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to play around with this. I definitely want to play around with this. It might be too hard to pull off in draft. It may be constructed only, but I'll give it a shot, and I will definitely be staying on the lookout for it. I think Indulgent Aristocrat is pretty solid, uh, and I'm going to give it a B-. minus. Next up, we have Kindly Stranger. Kindly Stranger is two and a black for a creature human at Uncommon. It's a 2-3, and it has Delirium. Pay two and a black. Transform Kindly Stranger. 
activate this ability only if you have delirium. So it's a 2-3 three for 3 that does nothing if you don't have delirium. But if you do, you pay 2 and a black and flip it over to become Demon Possessed Witch. Demon Possessed Witch is a creature, human shaman. It's a 4-3, and when this creature transforms into Demon Possessed Witch, you may destroy target creature. Well, that is powerful. The backside of this thing is Necrotol. Necrotol is pretty darn solid. Um, I think this is going to be the key barometer for Delirium, though. I think this card, there's a few others, but I think this card is really going to be the card that says, hey, Delirium's pretty reliable, and you can definitely build solid Delirium decks in draft, and this is going to be an amazing card in it. Or it's going to say, hey, Delirium's super inconsistent. It's really hard to build a deck that works on it. This card's terrible. So I don't know where to rate this card because I haven't played with Delirium yet. If Delirium is not reliable, this card is bad. It's a 2-3 for three, 3. That is not something you want to be playing too much of. You want to replace those as much as you can. If you have to play it, you can. But you want to replace it as much as you can. If Delirium is easy to pull off, this thing is Necrotol. This thing is 2 and a black at instant speed to blow up a creature. Any creature. That is super solid. I'm going to go with a C plus on it. I'm going to be cautious to begin with, but this does have a pretty high ceiling if Delirium is easy to pull off. Next up is Liliana's Indignation. Liliana's Indignation is X black for a sorcery at Uncommon. Put the top X cards of your library into your graveyard. Target player loses two life for each creature card put into your graveyard this way. This seems bad. You know I hate inconsistency, and this is inconsistency incarnate. Uh, it's kind of dirty hairy going on here. Did I play seven creatures or did I play eight? Uh, this card just seems awful. Uh, unless you know exactly how many creatures are left in your library, which you should know. That should be something that you should be eas easily able to calculate. Um, you should remember how many creatures are in your deck, how many you've played, how many are in your graveyard. That's all public information. And derive how many are left in your deck. And if you mill the mathematically required amount to guarantee that you hit a lethal amount of damage, cool, this card seems fine. But that's going to take a ton of mana. It's going to take a ton of luck if you have more than like 10 cards left in your library. Uh, it's just way too much of a gamble. And if it doesn't kill your opponent, it just doesn't do enough. Just blech. I don't want to touch this. I'll die to it. I'm sure I'm going to die to this card, but I don't think it's ever going to be the right choice to uh to uh to play this card so i'm out i'm totally out give it an f next up we have macabre waltz macabre waltz is one and a black for a sorcery at common return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand then discard a card macabre waltz we most recently saw in magic origins where it did next to nothing and i think it's going to do next to nothing here uh, when this card was first revealed as being in the set, everybody was like, oh, there's a Madness Enabler, yeah! But you have to pay two mana. You have to pay two mana and cast this spell first. So many of the really good Madness cards are the X mana cards. The X ma Madness cards, where you pay X black black or X red or X whatever and do something big and splashy, and you're already handicapping yourself by being down at least two mana by casting Macabre Waltz. I don't like that. I'll pay one mana. I'll tap a creature to discard a card. I don't want to pay two full mana and a card to discard a card. Now you get two creatures back to your hand, but that's always been slow and never really been great. Yeah, sometimes you get your bomb back, but that means that you're behind. That means that you've already cashed your bomb and it's already been answered. So, eh. I don't like Macabre Waltz. It's too slow. It never really does what people think of. People get really best case scenario mentality on this card. Um, I'm not going to play it too much until I see differently. I'm going to give it a C minus. Uh, I just, I, I, it's going to be better than it was in Origins for sure, but not too much better. I don't think so. C minus. Next up, we have Markov Dread Knight. Markov Dread Knight is three black black for a creature vampire knight at rare. It's a three three. It's got flying for two and a black and discard a card. You can put two plus one plus one counters on Markov Dread Knight. So it could be I'm a 5-5 five, five flyer, a 7-7 seven, seven flyer, a 9-9 nine, nine flyer, etc. Uh, yeah, seems pretty good. Seems pretty good. Five mana, three, three flyer. Uh, I would prefer to have a static ability on it, Vigilance or something like that, kind of like uh, Ghostly Sentinel. But being able to make this a 5-5 five, five by pitching a card is pretty nice. Any bigger than that, and this thing is just getting out of control and should be ending the game 
basically immediately. Um, being a flyer, getting counters, super, super, super solid. I'd be happy to play this every single time and probably first pick it. It's vulnerable. It doesn't have hexproof. It doesn't have indestructible. There's no way of protecting itself uh, from non-burn removal. Um, but it does protect itself nicely from, you know, minus three, minus three or things like that. If you have mana, discard a card and suddenly it's bigger. Uh, but yeah, just be careful with it. It, it. it can be vulnerable, but I think it's first pickable and always playable and just super solid. So A minus. Next up, we have Merciless Resolve. Merciless Resolve is two and a black for an instant at common. As an additional cost to cast Merciless Resolve, sacrifice a creature or a land, draw two cards. Um, nah, it's fine. It's one more mana than Alter's Reap was. Alter's Reap was one in a black instant, sack a creature, draw two cards. This is one more mana and we get to sack a land. I think that makes this a little bit better in the late game when we're not mana starved. You know, we have seven lands and we don't have seven drops in our deck. Why not turn a land into two cards? That seems pretty solid to me, actually. Um, still, Alter's Reap was really at its best in a set with Morbid where killing a creature meant that we were going to have better effects on our next card that we played. Unless you have some really awesome ways to use sacrifice effects, I'm not sure if this is super playable outside of kind of a late controlling black deck that really wants card draw. Um, I think it's fine. I, I wouldn't fault anybody for playing this, and I wouldn't fault anybody for cutting it, I think, uh, which is kind of the definition of a C. Take it, leave it, both right choices. Uh, yeah, just middle of the road C. Up next, we have Mind Rack Demon. Mind Rack Demon is two black black for a creature demon mythic. It's a 4-5 flying trample sold, but when it enters the battlefield, put the top four cards of your library into your graveyard. Well, that's not too bad. I'm still totally sold. It has Delirium. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose four life unless you have Delirium. This is one of the few cards where it's uh, if you don't have Delirium, something happens. Uh, yeah, so it's a 4-5 flying trample that mills four cards and uh, hits you for four damage every single turn if you don't have Delirium. I think I'm pretty okay with this. 4-5 trample for four might just be worth taking four a turn anyways... As long as you're ahead when this comes down, it's not too bad that you're taking four damage. If you're behind, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, if you're on parity, it's still kind of a big deal because you'll die first, assuming nothing else happens other than you take four and they take four a turn. Um, the fact that this thing throws away four cards potentially turns on Delirium immediately, which takes away the downside a little bit. Um, but I think you have to really make sure that you have the proper count of cards that you're going to somewhat reliably uh, enable Delirium for this thing. I think it's first pickable. It feels really balmy to me. It feels really, really, really balmy to me, especially for four mana. Um, but I think you need to make sure that Delirium is going to be online for it to be a little bit more consistent because it would suck to be at 18 and your opponent's at 20, and you have this in your hand. Because then you're going to 14 by the time, or actually just before your opponent even begins to go to 16, and you're just going to lose that race. So, I don't know. I, I want to like this card. I want to think that the downside isn't that big of a downside, but we'll have to see. It's going to depend on Delirium, I think. Uh, the fact that this has four cards going to the graveyard right away is a good chance of you getting there, um, but I'll have to see. I'll have to see. I'm going to go with a B plus. Uh, I'm optimistic about this card, but uh, B plus. Next up, we have Morkrut Necropod. Five and a black for a creature slug horror. It's an uncommon. It's a 7-7. Seven, seven. It's got menace. I, I don't know why a giant slug has menace. Um, but anyways, whenever Morkrut Necropod attacks or blocks, sacrifice another creature or land. This is interesting. It, it, it's kind of a holdover from Avacyn Restored's loner theme. Uh, so in Avacyn Restored, black creatures often wanted to play by themselves. They got bonuses if they played by themselves, or they sacked other creatures. Um, they always wanted to play by themselves, and it was bad. It was really bad. It was one of the critical flaws of Avacyn Restored from a limited perspective. Now this is even a little bit worse, because it's not just other creatures. It's also going to hit your lands. In order for this thing to have no downside, it needs to be the only thing on the board. Literally. You need to have an empty board, no lands. Just this. You can have some enchantments or a planeswalker. Uh, but yeah, this, ugh, I don't like this card. I don't like this card at all. Six mana for a 7-7 seven, seven menace. Whenever it attacks or blocks, sacrifice another creature or land. That just seems like such a big downside. If I'm in a position where I can 
just aggressively attack in with a 7-7 menace and just say, ah, throw away this land, throw away this creature. I should be in a situation where a 4-4 that doesn't have that giant downside will be doing the same effect and I will continue to keep my board presence. Um, This just feels way too, you know, just kind of carpet bomb your entire board state all in on this 177 that has no way of protecting itself. It will die to all kinds of removal. Uh, Yeah, I don't like this card. I don't like this card. I've seen some people get kind of excited about it. I just don't see it. Um, I'm on a C- minus on it at the moment. I think I will cut it almost all the time. (sighs) I don't know. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. I, I don't assume everybody's wrong. Everybody who's giving it C pluses and B minuses, and I've seen some Bs out there. Um, but I'm going with C minus on it for now. I'll keep an eye on it, though. Next up, we have Murderous Compulsion. Murderous Compulsion is one in a black for a sorcery at common. Destroy target tapped creature. Madness, one in a black. Uh, not bad. I think we learned that this isn't guaranteed removal with Sheer Drop. Uh, so, you know, Sheer Drop, when we first saw it, we were like, yeah, it'll kill everything. Things are always tapped. And then frequently we would have it in hand and we'd be like, why aren't things being tapped? They have vigilance or the, or they're just not attacking or, or they're tapping at the end of their turn. Now, this card can get around that last effect because you can give this instant speed if you discard it instead. So being able to make this instant speed is pretty nice. And, you know, Sheer Drop was still okay. And the fact that this is a single uh, generic and a single black makes this pretty okay as well, I think. Um, You know, I'm not going to cut this card all that often. Uh, I'm just not going to place it as premium removal. I'm not going to first pick this card ever. Um, But I'll still pretty highly pick it, and I'll still play the first one for sure, and maybe even the second one. Um, So I'll give this a B-. I think it's solid. Uh, Not amazing, not premium, just totally fine and solid. So B-. Up next is Olivia's Bloodsworn. Olivia's Bloodsworn is one and a black for a creature vampire soldier at Uncommon. It's a 2-1 flyer. Olivia's Bloodsworn can't block. And for a single red mana, it gains haste until end of turn. Uh, yeah, it's totally fine. Uh, this is a strictly better Vampire Interloper from the original Innistrad. Vampire Interloper was one and a black for a Vampire Scout, I think. Maybe it was a Warrior. Uh, it was a 2-1 flyer that couldn't block. This is exactly the same thing, except for a single red mana, you can give it haste. Uh, two one flyer for two, the camp lock is fairly standard. It's always been totally fantastic as a beat down card. It's not amazing, it's not a bomb, it's not going to win you games, but it's going to get in a lot of early damage and uh, set you up for the, the mid game. Uh, yeah, for a single red mana, you can make this hasty, that's pretty darn solid, so this can become a three drop if you want. Uh, one black red and you've got yourself a hasty two one flyer. It's not a bomb, uh, but it'll get in for a lot of damage, and I think it's going to be a, a very solid card for Black Red Vampires decks. Uh, B minus. Yeah, I, I think this card's just totally fine. Don't ever first pick it. Don't ever second pick it or third pick it or probably even fourth pick it. Maybe fourth pick it is kind of where it can go. Um, but yeah, it is still a high pick, and once you're in those colors, it should be an even higher pick. B minus. Next up, we have Pale Rider of Trostad. Pale Rider of Trostad is one and a black for a creature spirit at uncommon. It's a 3-3. It's got Skulk, and when it enters the battlefield, you discard a card. Um, Yeah, it also seems pretty fine. I can't imagine ever not playing this. It's a 2-mana 3-3 Skulk, and all I have to do is discard a card. I am totally sold. This just seems super solid. I don't even care if I'm enabling Madness. I don't even care if I'm enabling Delirium. I'm playing a 3-3 Skulk for 2. I'm totally happy doing that. Uh, Again, just like uh, Olivia's Bloodsworn, it's not a bomb. It's not amazing. Don't ever first pick this. But I will third pick this. I'll fourth pick this. Uh, I will jam this in every single black deck I ever play. Uh, Yeah, it seems super, super fine. Uh, I've got to go with a solid B on it. Next up, we have Pick the Brain. Pick the Brain is two and a black for a sorcery at Uncommon. Target opponent reveals his or her hand. You choose a non-land card from it and exile that card. Delirium. If you have Delirium, then search that player's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with the same name as the exiled card. Exile those cards. Then that player shuffles his or her library. No, 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 no. Uh, Thoughtseize type effects are barely playable and limited. Thoughtseize, while an incredible constructed card, totally valuable, first pickable purely for value, 
it wasn't a great card in draft or in sealed. Um, this is more expensive. And if you have Delirium, you get the Slaughter Games effect, which is totally pointless and limited because you're generally never going to hit multiple cards with the same name. Um, for three mana, this card's just absolute garbage. I can't wait to play against people who pick and main deck this. I love, love when somebody transgresses the mind. I love when somebody casts Duress or any of those cards because it's them just wasting a card slot, wasting a turn, just terrible value. You should never play this card. You should never pick this card. F minus. Next up, we have Rancid Rats. Rancid Rats is one and a black for a creature zombie rat at common. It's a 1-1. One, one. It's got Skulk, and it's got Death Touch. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever said, man, I really like these Typhoid Rats, but I wish they could attack. Uh, this, this just feels like a downgrade to me. Typhoid Rats was a single black mana for a 1-1 one, one Death Touch. It didn't have Skulk. Uh, typhoid Rats were great because they stayed home. They stayed home on de defense, they blocked everything, your opponent was really nervous about attacking, and if you did attack, your opponent basically had to choose, do I want to take a damage or do I want to lose a creature? And typically you were attacking because you wanted them to throw a creature in the way because you were going to follow up with a better creature or more removal or something like that. This takes away that option. This takes away that option. This is a Typhoid Rats that can only attack in and be generally almost always unblocked which isn't quite what I want. Now, it still functions as a Typhoid Rats that just stays home, which is totally fine. It's just a little bit annoying that you have to pay an extra mana for uh, an effect that I'm probably very rarely, if ever, going to actually want to have. I would so much prefer that this was just Typhoid Rats. Um, still, it, it, it is just Typhoid Rats if I don't want to do that attacking bluffing game, which was a, a somewhat corner case anyway. So I'm going to go C plus on this. I'm never going to cut this card, and I might even play the second one, but I, I just dislike that I'm playing an extra mana for an ability that I'm basically never going to use. So C plus. Next up, we have Relentless Dead. Relentless Dead is black black for a creature zombie at Mythic. It's a 2-2. It has Menace. When Relentless Dead dies, you may pay black if you do return it to its owner's hand. When Relentless Dead dies, you may pay X if you do return another target zombie creature card with converted mana cost X from your graveyard to the battlefield. This card seems fun. This card seems really fun. I love this thing. I want to play it really, 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 really badly. Um, this should be, there should be enough zombies and good zombies for there to be a solid blue-black zombie deck. And I think this is going to be kind of the icing on the cake. I think taking this pack one, pick one, and saying, yep, I'm going zombies, or I'm going to try really hard to go zombies, is uh, certainly a thing. You can either get big things that can come back, or you can get cool end of the battlefield effects that can come back. The fact that this thing can't really die as long as you have a single black mana is really nice. Totally a first pickable card. It's not quite a bomb, exactly, because it's a 2-2. But it is super solid. It's going to be a key part of a really cool engine. Uh, I will happily first pick this every single time. Uh, just straight up A from me. Next up, we have Rotten Heart Ghoul. Rotten Heart Ghoul is three and a black for a creature zombie at common. It's a 2-4. When it dies, target player discards a card. Meh, 2-4 for 4 is fine, and it maybe helps your madness or delirium if your opponent kills it or you sack it. It doesn't seem all that great or amazing. There's far better ways to go about enabling delirium or enabling madness, and there's way better creatures to play. So I think I'm just going to cut this card pretty hard. Uh, I think I will cut it way more often than I play it. So next up, we have Sanatorium Skeleton. Sanatorium Skeleton is some really cool art. It's kind of like early 2000s, mid 2000s uh, magic art. Uh, single black mana, creature skeleton. It's a common. It's a one, two. For two and a black, you can return Sanitarium Skeleton from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, not what I want to be playing. Really not what I want to be playing. It's a one, two for one that doesn't do anything. It doesn't attack. It doesn't block well. It doesn't kill things. It doesn't wear ore as well or equipment. Uh, I could waste some mana to bring it back to my hand. I mean, it chump blocks for days if you really feel like paying four mana every turn, which means you're probably not really doing anything else. Um, yeah, I'm just totally out in this card. Uh, I don't think it's 100% unplayable, but I think it's pretty darn close to it. Uh, so I'm going to go D- minus on this one. Next up, we have Shambleback. Shambleback is a single black mana for a sorcery at common. 
exile target creature card from a graveyard, put a 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield, you gain two life. Um, yeah, it's a 2-2 for one with gain two life when it enters the battlefield. That's that's not the worst, uh, but you do need to have a target for it, which means this is never coming down on turn one, so it doesn't overly matter that it's a one drop 2-2. Two, two. More likely, this is turn four or five that you're finally going to have a creature in somebody's graveyard to exile, which at that point, a 2-2 two, is nowhere near as exciting at all. Uh, it doesn't likely turn off Delirium too consistently, since creatures should be the most common card and the easiest card to get into the graveyard. Ultimately, I just don't think this is good enough for a main deck. I think you could play it if you were desperate, but I generally don't want to be there. C minus. I, I don't really like Shambleback. I ain't no Shambleback girl. Next up, we have Sinister Concoction. Sinister Concoction is a single black mana for an enchantment at Uncommon. And it's got a, a four-line cost to it. I love this cost. Pay a black mana. Pay a life. Put the top card of your library into your graveyard. Discard a card. Sacrifice Sinister Concoction. Colon. That is the cost. You have to do all of that before you get the effect. What effect do you get? Well, you get the effect destroy target creature. You get a pretty good effect there. If we were pretending this was a, a sorcery speed removal spell, it would be black, black, Pay a life, mill a card, discard a card, destroy target creature. And that is super duper fine. The fact that this can be instant speed, although it's going to be instant speed with your opponent being well aware that it's going to be coming, then it uh, is even slightly better than that. Um, it gets an enchantment into the graveyard, which helps you with one of the harder to get cards to enable delirium. This just seems super solid. Just seems super solid. Uh, it'll also encourage your opponent to try to bait you into using it early. So make sure that you are using this on things that matter, things that you do really want to use it on. Um, still, I think I like this enough. Uh, just be aware of those times late in the game where you're top decking and this card suddenly turned off. Because I think some people might actually forget about that. There's so many costs to this card. Some people might forget they have to discard a card. And if you're top decking, this card's dead, unfortunately. But that's uh, uh, only a... Slight corner case, so I'm still pretty happy with this card. I'm going to take it pretty highly. I'm going to play the first one at a minimum, probably even the second one. Uh, B minus from me. Next up, we have Stallion of Ashmouth. Stallion of Ashmouth is three and a black for a creature nightmare horse at common. It's a three three and it's got delirium. Pay one and a black. Stallion of Ashmouth gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Activate this ability only if you have delirium. Uh, so it's a three three for four, which is okay. You know that that's not purely on the vanilla test, but it's still okay. And it's got a cheap shade ability. The shade ability, of course, being uh, pay something. Often it's a black. One in a black isn't uncommon, though, to give plus one, plus one. Assuming you cast this card with two black mana, so you pay virtually two black black for this, that means that it can be a 5-5 five, five the first turn that it's able to attack, if you have delirium. That's pretty decent. I would main deck the first one of these if Delirium's consistent. If Delirium's not consistent, I would still main deck this as a 23rd, I need another creature kind of card. So I think this is a C minus at uh, an absolute minimum. And with the ability, I think this can also go up to like a C. Uh, again, I think this will be one of the barometers for Delirium if it can turn on or not. If it can't, this card is C minus at best. If it can, this card is C, maybe even C plus. Next up, we've got Stromkirk Mentor. Stromkirk Mentor is a three and a black creature vampire soldier at common. It's a 4-2. When Stromkirk Mentor enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on another target vampire creature you control. Um, not hitting itself is a relatively big deal. And uh, as we kind of realized with things like Zulaport Chain Mage and Belligerent Whiptail, four twos for four are not the best set of stats. They die to everything. This could be okay as maybe a one-of in the vampire deck, but really this thing's going to not do too much else by itself. It dies to basically everything at only half its mana cost. Seems relatively weak. I'd probably prefer most other cards over this one, but I would begrudgingly play the first one if I need be, if I need a 23rd card or a creature or whatever. Uh, so C- minus for Stromkirk Mentor. Next up, we have Throttle. Throttle's back. Four and a black for an instant common. Target creature gets minus four, minus four until end of turn. Uh, this is removal. It's not the best of removal because it's expensive. Five mana is a lot, but minus four, minus four should kill an 
awful lot of things in this set. It doesn't stack terribly well because you don't want a lot of five drops in your deck uh, and you want a number of those to be creatures preferably, but the first one is usually always playable. Uh, so pure C+. Next up, we have To the Slaughter. To the Slaughter is two and a black for an instant at rare, and there's a poor little lamb going to get eaten by a giant demon there. Target player sacrifices a creature or planeswalker. So in limited, this says target player sacrifices a creature, of course. Delirium. If there, if you have Delirium, then instead that player sacrifices a creature and a planeswalker. And so in limited, that of course means it does the exact same thing whether or not you have Delirium. Because of course planeswalkers are going to be on the other side of the battlefield, so super duper rarely. Now there are four in this set, whereas we usually have three in most sets, so there will be a slight uptick in people playing Planeswalkers, but not really, not, not too much to be even really noticeable. So really this is just an instant speed edict at three. Instant speed edicts are fine, uh, they offer some nice versatility, especially when your opponent has one creature on the battlefield and they play another, and you can decide if you want to, in response to that creature, force them to kill that one creature that was sitting there before the second one comes down. This gets worse later in the game because, of course, if your opponent has four creatures on the battlefield and one of them is a 1-1 one -one from way back on turn two, they'll kill that one. But edicts are still fine. I think this is probably first pickable a decent amount of the time. Uh, B minus, I'll, I'll be happy to have this. It's not as amazing as pure removal, but it's still totally fine. Next up, we have Tooth Collector. Tooth Collector is two and a black for a creature human rogue at uncommon. It's a 3-2. When Tooth Collector enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, if you have Delirium, uh, target creature that player controls gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. Um, this is flat out better Eyeblade Assassin. It's not an elf, I suppose, but that's not really relevant in Shadows Over Innistrad. Uh, Eyeblade Assassin was always fine, though unexciting. It was a two and a black 2-2. Uh, that uh, did minus one, minus one to target creature. This is a two and a black three, two that does minus one, minus one. And sometimes you're going to get to uh, do minus one, minus one every turn. This totally shuts out your opponent from playing X ones and makes combat math a bit more of a headache. Um, but I don't think this is ever first pickable. Uh, again, unless delirium is super duper easy to turn on, I just don't see this activating a ton of the time. But it's still totally playable just from the non-delirium rules text. So C+, I'll play the first one basically always, and uh, we'll see how delirium does. Next up, we have Triskaidekaphobia. Triskaidekaphobia, of course, is the fear of the number 13. Uh, Triskaidekaphobia is three and a black for an enchantment at rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, choose one. Each player with exactly 13 life loses the game. Then each player gains a life. Or each player with exactly 13 life loses the game. Then each player loses a life. Uh, <laughs> this is cute. This is fun. I, I want to play this. I want to play it really bad, but it is just terrible. Um, I don't think you should ever actually take or play this, but it's hilarious. Um, I feel it's too cute to be pinging your opponent or pumping their life total up to try to get them to 13 when you're also dangerously getting there. Um, this is not a may ability. So if you're at 13, you lose. So your opponent will be attempting to get you to 13 as well, hitting you with things, maybe even casting gain life spells, although that's very narrow and very hard to pull off. Um, but yeah, there, there's just there's too much to go wrong here. There's way too much to go wrong here that just makes this basically a dead card or a card that will surprise kill you. Uh, this feels like Demonic Pact, which was also just totally unplayable and limited. Um, you shouldn't really ever touch this card. I, I've got to give it a... a I'm sorry, I've got to give it an F. It's just not a card that you should be playing for anything other than funsies. In a competitive setting, for real, for actually trying to win, you should not be playing this card. Uh, just F. Next up, we have Twins of Mara Estate. Uh, four and a black for a creature vampire at common. It's a 3-5, and it's got madness for two and a black for a pair of creepy, creepy, creepy zombie twins. Uh, yeah, so it's a 3-5 for five, and sometimes it's a 3-5 for three. Three fives for five are pretty standard these days, and they're always okay as blockers for decks that want to transition into the late game. They're not good for aggressive decks. So the fact that this could come down for three doesn't really do much for me. You know, a three five that I have to jump through some hoops to get down on turn three that I can be aggressive with just isn't worth it to me. I'd rather just play a three three. Yeah, it's going to die a lot more readily, but I'm not jumping through any hoops to get there. I'm not sometimes having it just stuck in my hand until I get to five. Um, so I don't think this card's amazing. I, I'd also, I also don't think it's bad. I think it's just pure filler level. So 
total C for me. Obviously gets better with the Vampire's deck, but total C. Next up, we have Vampire Noble. Vampire Noble is two and a black for a 3-2 creature vampire at common, and it has no rules text, just flavors text. So yeah, three mana, 3-2. Three it's a vampire, so it's a relevant uh, creature type, but it's really just pure filler. 3-2 three, for three isn't the worst. It can be a little bit aggressive. Uh, it synergizes with vampires. Just run-of-the-mill C. Not really too much to say here. Cut it if you have better stuff. Leave it in if you don't. Finally, the last card of the Black Set Review is Vessel of Malignity. Vessel of Malignity is one and a black for an enchantment at common. Pay one and a black, sacrifice Vessel of Malignity. Target opponent exiles two cards from his or her hand. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. So it's uh, a cheap mind rot when you activate it. Overall, it's an expensive mind rot, and you get an enchantment card into the graveyard. I liked Vessel of Paramnesia. I did not like Vessel of uh, Ephemera. I don't really care for Vessel of Malignity either. It's a little bit more playable in Sealed than it is in Draft, but I generally don't think you want to play this even to enable Delirium. I think there's just better ways to go about it. Uh, you don't want to play bad cards to enable Delirium. You don't want to play Bonesaw to enable Surge. You don't want to play this to enable Delirium. So I've got to go with a D- minus on it. Please also be aware, this does not help you get Delirium by discarding your own cards because A you have to target an opponent. B, you exile the cards. It doesn't actually discard them. So it doesn't at least uh, help your opponent do Madness or Delirium because it is exiling the cards. But still, I just don't think you want to play this. Maybe in Sealed, but outside of that, I don't think so. So D minus. So that's going to wrap it up for the Black Set Review. Black looks pretty good. Black Red Vampires looks amazing. Um, black is definitely also going to be the home of Delirium. Uh, I think it's going to be a really key bar barometer for is Delirium something that's going to happen. Uh, I think Black White Delirium might kind of be uh, where they're trying to go. Whether or not that works out, I don't know. But there's a lot of cool cards here that I want to play with. Uh, a lot of the Vampires, Relentless Dead, of course. Zombies, I'm really happy to give a try. And there's uh, an okay amount of removal. There's surprising a bit more removal in some of the other colors than there are in uh, black. But yeah, let me know what your favorite card was in black. Let me know anything you disagree with, anything you think I'm approaching wrong, uh, and uh, we can all discuss it down there with each other. Uh, and I'll be down there, of course, as well. But as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at the Manaleek. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. And you can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Manaleek. You've already found me here on YouTube. You've got that comment section down below. Please make use of that. As well, if you enjoy my videos, click that little thumbs up icon. That lets me you know that you like the videos. It makes me feel good. Also lets the world know and keeps my videos rising up through the ranks. As well, if you haven't subscribed, you should. There's a button below each video. There's one in the outro of each video, and clicking that will keep you up to date on all the latest videos, uh, such as the Red Set Review that's coming sometime tomorrow. You want to know when that happens, so make sure that you are subscribed. As well, please feel free to share the Manaleek uh, far and wide in Facebook groups at your local store, uh, any subreddits that you frequent, forums, etc. Spread the word of the Manaleek. I want to make this the best and biggest set review I've had to date. It's looking good so far, just a couple days in, and there's a full couple weeks worth of set review content and, of course, pre-release content. I do all kinds of pre-release recaps and over-the-shoulder drafts and all kinds of actual paper videos for you all to watch before they're up anywhere else. So please spread the word, share, subscribe, like, and as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow.